Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Performance-Based Assessments for Teaching and Learning. I'm Sunny Day, a Program Director with the National Conference of State Legislatures Education Program, where I oversee our work on personalized and competency-based learning. This webinar is the third in a series sponsored by the NCSL Student-Centered Learning Commission, a bipartisan group of state legislators studying legislative policy options, obstacles, and recommendations to help states move forward with systems that support student-centered learning opportunities. Student-centered learning generally means that learning is personalized, learning is competency-based, learning takes, time at, takes place anytime, anywhere, and students have ownership over their learning. Our webinars to date have included an overview of competency-based education and a look at elements of state ESSA plans that are student-centered. If you missed those webinars, the archived videos and PowerPoints are available on the NCSL website. The Commission would like to thank the Nellie May Education Foundation for sponsoring our work and this webinar series. Today we are lucky to hear from one of the nation's top experts on performance-based assessments. Scott Marion is the President and Executive Director of the National Center for Assessment, a Dover, New Hampshire nonprofit consulting firm. The Center for Assessment is the lead technical partner and key policy advisor for the New Hampshire's Innovative Assessment and Accountability Pilot, Performance Assessments of Competency Education also known as PACE. Dr. Marion's current projects include designing and supporting states in implementing assessment and accountability reforms, developing and implementing educator evaluation systems, and designing and implementing high-quality, locally designed performance-based assessments. He is a recognized national leader in designing innovative and comprehensive assessment systems to support both instructional and accountability uses, including helping states and districts design systems of assessments for evaluating student learning of identified competencies. This webinar will provide an overview of performance-based assessments, how they can be used to improve both teaching and learning, and a look at the New Hampshire PACE Performance Assessment System. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Marion. Thank you. Thanks, Sonny. Let me, so I don't have to look at myself, I'll switch the slide quickly. Greetings, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna, as Sonny did a nice job of introducing uh, what intent to talk about, I, uh, I, I term this a little bit of back to the future, and you'll see why um, shortly. So as Sunny said, we're going to give, we'll give a little bit about the current context, why we're doing this work and uh, what do we think uh, are some of the problems that we're hoping to solve. I'll talk a little bit about some of the basics of performance assessment and most importantly, uh, this, this notion of deeper learning and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you know, it, it's not that we're looking to do performance assessments just because we were bored and needed something else to do. A lot of the work around performance assessments is a way to shift towards uh, both incentivizing and uh, measuring deeper learning on the parts of students. I'll talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in New Hampshire and then talk about some of the, uh, the challenges that we face and others face in, in doing this uh, hard but very important work. So what are the concerns about uh, the current testing environment? And, and I am, as, uh, as Sonny said, I am a measurement expert by training. I have a PhD in, in measurement and evaluation. I'm actually here in New York City today uh, because our conference, uh, the, our main national, international conference, National Council of Measurement and Education starts uh, this afternoon here in New York. And so there'll be a thousand, uh, measurement experts um, gathered for three days to, to talk about all sorts of uh, 
esoteric issues. I know it sounds like tremendous fun to all of you, but uh, it, it, it is for, uh, for geeky people like me. But one of the things that I say is as a field of, of measurement and assessment folks, we, we have overpromised what our tests can do. Um, and I, what I'm talking about in general on our tests, our end of year state standards-based exams, uh, people early, and I was just as guilty as everyone early in the day of this. I've been at this since the late 90s, uh, working in various states, that uh, we said, oh, yeah, they'll deliver good, useful information to help schools improve instruction. And uh, it's pretty clear that, that for lots of reasons it's falling short on that promise. Um, we, we've created almost a tower of Babel of incoherent tests that are, you know, administered at the state, district, school, and classroom level. And that's something that uh, uh, several of us are working on to try to improve, to try to make things more coherent. We've um, clearly under-delivered meaningful and useful information to teachers and students, uh, for, again, from our state tests. Um, and, and similarly, many of our tests are irrelevant uh, for our students. I actually have a blog coming out about this, about high school testing. You know, to give an 11th grade test to all kids in the state on the same day or same week, um, no matter what course they're taking, uh, and when it doesn't count for kids is, is a, really, uh, it's a really bad practice. Um, we're, we're not capitalizing as much as we can on key technology advance, advances. And then uh, fundamentally, we see a tremendous lack of assessment literacy um, at all levels of the system. So that's, this is not a blame the teachers thing. We see it uh, among teachers. We see it among uh, leaders. We see it among uh, policy leaders. And not that everybody needs to have the same types of assessment literacy, but it, it is a tremendous problem that, again, we continue to work on. So. You know, I was at a meeting a few years ago, a National Research Council meeting, and there was it was being funded. I won't name the funder, but there were several of us on this committee, and it was a pretty uh, impressive committee, who uh, were listening to the opening remarks by the funder as we were about to get started with our works. And this funder kept saying, "And we want to be really innovative, and we, you know, we want to push to deeper student learning." and a colleague and I, and maybe it's because we're you know both a little older, said we'd be really happy to go back to the 1990s, uh, and this is where this Back to the Future reference comes from. We were doing fabulous things around the country. The Maryland School Performance Assessment Program was uh, was a was a groundbreaking program in interdisciplinary, uh, rich performance tasks. The Kentucky Reform Act with its math and writing portfolios was terrific. California's learning assessment system or CLASS um, uh, had a tremendous number of performance tasks. Uh, Oregon had its uh, Certificate of Initial Mastery and Certificate of Advanced Mastery programs. Vermont had a portfolio system. And where I was the assessment director in Wyoming, we had a uh, we called a body of evidence graduation system uh, comprised of, of many rich performance tasks. And those are just things at the state level. There's tremendous stuff going on in districts and schools. So we, we, we have done this before, and we've done it well. Um, we, we ran into some uh, political and policy issues, for sure. And we didn't fully understand all the technical issues at that time that we, have under, that we understand there. And it wasn't perfect. Um, the rush to accountability in certain states led to... Uh, Many concerns about technical quality, particularly about student level reliability, and those are some of the concerns that I say are misplaced. It was only after the fact that two of my colleagues, Rich Hill and Charlie DePascali, showed that you could have quite uh, low levels or modest levels of student level reliability and still have very good school level reliability, and that's where we're making the decisions. We're really not making the decisions at the student level. Um, and there's a National Research, Research Council report called Best Practices for State Assessment Systems is a part one and part two that document many of these efforts. And so why are we here? This is uh, Philip Schleckley, who recently passed away, wrote this fabulous book back in 2001 called Shaking Up the Schoolhouse. And I, I use this quote a lot because it really resonates with me. And this is, you know, what we argue, that the business of schools is to invent tasks, activities, and assignments that students find engaging 
and that bring them into profound interactions with content and processes they will need to master to be judged well-educated. So in some sense, he's talking about competency-based education before that was part of the lexicon. But this notion of profound interactions, if students are being brought into profound interactions with content, they're going to be engaged in that, and they're going to be interested in furthering their own learning and their own performance. So one of the things we've seen with those previous reforms is that performance-based assessments of some flavor appear to be a common denominator in these, in these uh, innovative and rich reforms that we saw prior to No Child Left Behind that we're seeing again. And what are performance assessments? Uh, people call them a lot of things in this chapter that a colleague and I wrote. Um, we have a nice matrix um, that, uh, is, that highlights different types of uh, defining characteristics of things like performance assessments or portfolios or graduation exhibitions. But key thing about performance assessments is that students are asked to produce a product or carry out a performance that's scored according to a pre-specified criteria. Now, I'd go further and say you could do that for very simple kinds of procedures, but that's a waste of time, really. You could do that just as easily then if you're interested in simple. And recall, you could do that with a multiple choice question. And so we try to reserve performance assessments when we're asking students to think deeply. So we ask ourselves, and this is uh, something that comes up in, in the measurement field quite a lot, why, why would we do performance assessments? They cost more, they take more time, and they're hard to do well. So why do we do it? Well, in many ways, it's the only way to measure the intended construct. And so I have a picture of Yo-Yo Ma here. If, uh, if I want to know how well somebody plays the cello, I could create a multiple choice test to get at some aspects of cello playing. But I think you all know as well as I do that if I really want to measure cello playing, I have to listen to them play the cello. And that's not only for cello playing. If I want to know how well a student's able to design and carry out a scientific investigation, sure, I could create some questions that, that are proxies for certain aspects of scientific investigation, but I really have to see them do a whole investigation to understand how to wrestle with the nuances of doing so. In many cases, it's just a better way to measure the intended construct. Um, if, we, if we were interested in reading comprehension, for instance, and we really want to get at uh, students' uh, quality of their ability to make inferences from the text, I can do that with some short answer questions and things like that. But there's certain things, certain uh, types of analyses and inferences that I'd want to get at with, from students that I need some sort of open response to do so. Um, a really important piece is that when students uh, you know, engage in performance tasks, they both yield instructional information for the teacher so the teacher is able to observe and look at the actual student work to see what kind of instructional um, uh, changes they might make to, need to make, not just by looking at a score, but by actually looking at the work. But um, it, it actually provides some of that information to kids as well. And that's the next bullet is, is these performance tasks provide a learning opportunity for students as well as an assessment opportunity. If we do this well, the students um, should learn something about the content area and about their own knowledge of the content area by engaging in the performance tasks. And finally, if we're doing these things on a larger scale, we want to signal the type of instructional task that we'd like to see in the classrooms. And that's something we're seeing with uh, the New Hampshire project right now, PACE. It's something I've seen in many other states where we've, uh, where uh, rich tasks were prominently featured on either the state summative exam or in district exams, those kind of tasks became, um, became more widely used in the classroom. The classroom, a lot of classroom assessments and classroom work, unfortunately, in many cases, tends to mimic what people see on the state assessment. And so if all they see is low-level multiple-choice questions, unfortunately, that's what many kids will experience. This is something that uh, my graduate advisor, uh, Lori Shepard, and I put together back uh, uh, over 20 years ago. It's hard to believe that. But 
we, we try to, uh, on, on one sheet of paper, uh, sort of describe key issues around key qualities of educational assessment on, you know, one sheet of paper, and this is an expanded column. But we talk about characteristics of high quality tasks. And again, this is why we'd stay away from uh, these rote learning kinds of things. We, we want it to be essential, it represents key ideas of the subject matter, whether it's biology or algebra or, or fourth grade mathematics. Um, we want the task to represent a key uh, and major idea of the domain. It's, it's complex. It requires the students to engage with the content in deep and meaningful ways. It should be as authentic as possible. So to the extent possible, it should represent real world activities. Now simulations are okay and things like that, but it shouldn't be some classic, uh, you used to see a lot of these, pretend you're a Martian that landed on Earth and write about what you see. Um, kids knew that was a very contrived activity. Uh, it should be equitable. And so we want to make sure that it's uh, not biased to particular uh, groups of uh, students or individual students uh, to the extent possible. It should allow students to show what they know. Uh, the other side of that is not allowing students to pretend to know something when they don't. And so this is what we're talking about equitable. Many of the design processes we use now take into account universal design for learning and things like that. I already talked about the instructional component of it. It should be rich. It should allow students to develop extensions to go beyond the task there. And it should be engaging. I argue that um, if, if we can't create engaging tasks, and uh, you know, a lot of people are worried about things, let me just take a little bird walk here. A lot of people are worried about things like test security. They're worried about kids' interests. And I still say, shame on us if we can't create tasks that are interesting and engaging to kids that re wrestle with real-world phenomenon and real-world problems. And once you actually create engaging instructional and assessment tasks, a lot of behavior issues fade away, a lot of other issues fade away. And so that's the hard design work, is to create such tasks. Um, they should be active, students construct meaning, obviously accessible, again, as this universal design for learning. And it should be feasible. You know, it shouldn't require an additional $10,000 of school supplies to carry that out. So here's a, just a, a very simple idea, just where it doesn't have to be uh, something incredibly, uh, you know, multi-step and mind-boggling. And this is more like a formative kind of task. And um, every once in a while, I'm, I, I show this uh, to groups of teachers, and I'm always careful uh, not to let it linger on the screen too long because the math folks start obsessing about it because it is so much fun. And everybody could do A, right? That's, that's an important thing. We scaffold our way in for lots of uh, kids. Um, can you see three-fifths of something? Well, that's what's shaded right now. But can you see five-thirds of something? Right, so people think about that. Well, I see if I count the uh, the uh, five uh, uh, components of that rectangle, I could see five of those, and then the piece of shading is three. So it's, all right, I could do that. Now it gets a little trickier. Can you do um, uh, two thirds of three fifths? Can you just see one divided by three fifths? And all, all these are are solvable, but Having kids work through and persist in these kind of tasks is uh, you, you learn a lot about where the student is in terms of their understanding of proportionality and things like that. And so these are just as a very quick example of the kind of richness that we could easily get um, from, from a pretty short task. But as you know, if you solve all parts, it gets a little bit longer. So as I said, you know, we're not doing this just because we were bored with writing multiple choice questions. We're doing this for a reason. And the reason is to move towards deeper levels of understanding. So the term deeper learning has been popularized by a major Hewlett Foundation initiative, and we're thankful for that. But the important thing is modern theories of learning. So I'm not talking about the long uh, extinct uh, behaviorism uh, theories of uh, behavioristic theories of learning 
where people accumulated little bits of subject matter thinking that they would all the parts would add up to the whole. We've come to learn that that, that just doesn't work. Modern theories of learning focus on developing uh, a deep understanding. And why do we care about deep understanding? Because we want students to be able to transfer. And transfer means that they're able to then take what they've learned in one setting or multiple settings and use that information and use those, those knowledge and skills to be able to wrestle with novel problems that uh, they face in other contexts, or other classes, or uh, more importantly, in the real world. And we can't just teach students a deeper understanding um, and, and, you know, I think that we can do it once. Students need to be provided with multiple opportunities on both learning and assessment tasks in order to um, to actually develop this deeper understanding. And you think about that, um, uh, unfortunately, it's worked out okay, but I'll just say uh, you know, a, a family member has uh, recently undergone some uh, medical issues, and thankfully uh, he's, he's in good shape now. But um, one of the things that it was very obvious, it went, uh, he was, went to a uh, hospital, I won't mention the name of the hospital, but it was uh, not a major hospital, and got diagnosed uh, incorrectly, and, uh, and not because anybody was malicious, but because they hadn't seen these set of symptoms presented this way in, in, in one person uh, you know, that often. Lo and behold, went to Massachusetts General, which is a major hospital that focuses on integrative care and things like that, and they, they looked at him and said, no, that other hospital is clearly wrong, and this is why. And they see hundreds of cases uh, like this uh, family member a year. And that's, that's this idea of seeing multiple representations in multiple contexts. It's how you, you develop deep understanding. You think about a chess master who's able to see, you know, 10, 20 moves ahead where most of us who are not quite at that level you know, maybe see two or three moves ahead. This is based on uh, uh, research that's been going on, like I said, for the last 50 years. It was summarized nicely in 1999 in this volume, How People Learn, and there's a new volume coming out that's that just, it's, uh, this was, like I said, 1999. So just in the last 20 years, on all we've learned about um, uh, based on better understanding of how the brain itself works and uh, neuroscience is, is, is there's a new volume coming out that's taking into account all the new things we've learned about how the brain works. So you'll hear talk of generalization and in my field of measurement or assessment, generalizability is the assessment analog of transfer and learning. And what does that mean? And so if I give somebody a task, a performance task, or I give them a small set of um, uh, test items, 10 questions, whatever it might be, does that provide credible evidence the student really knows, or in the world of competency education, is competent in what's being claimed? So if I want to claim that, you know, Scott is competent at um, understanding and applying uh, knowledge of fractions to solve mathematical problems, that's a pretty substantial claim. If, if I, you know, if I completed one, no matter how good, performance task, would that be enough evidence for you to say, yes, I'll award this competency? Um, or do you need to see it multiple times with close approximations or multiple times with pretty different approximations, in other words, really quite different types of problems that supposedly tap the same domain. And so we care a lot about generalizability because, again, if our goal is to know if students are able to transfer to new settings, um, we can't just give them one type of problem and give it to them once and assume they know it. And this is a real concern for competency-based education systems. We want to declare that students have demonstrated mastery and can move on, but there's a great risk of being uh, wrong about that because then we might not, uh, students might be missing important knowledge and skills that they'll need later. 
Um, and this notion of cognitive rigor, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, is one of the ways that we operationalize deeper learning. Um, and here's just a little example. So if you look and say, um, using a math example, fill in the given table with the results of your bouncy ball experiment. Um, and then moving up a little bit, we'd say, organize the results of your bouncy ball experiment into a table, still heavily scaffolded. And then finally, I say, craft it create a mathematical model that best reflects the results of your experiment and justify a decision for the chosen model. That's considerably more cognitively complex than simply organizing your results into a table. I don't know if you could all see this on here. This is a, this is a little cartoon that I'm saying that if you would have been a little more proficient in math, this never would have happened. And that's why we care about transfer and generalizability. So why do we need to innovate? Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of different reasons here. We need to find ways to support multiple users in the system, not just the state policy leaders, uh, even though I know I'm talking to mostly state policy leaders, uh, but we need to ensure that uh, teachers, parents, school principals, and others have the information they need. And that requires some rebalancing of the system. And uh, we need to support both increases in student and educator learning. So New Hampshire's innovative model is, uh, was uh, originated under a series of waivers, first from No Child Left Behind in 2014-15, and then uh, under ESSA in 2015-16 uh, and then 16-17 as a pilot accountability, assessment accountability system for a limited number of New Hampshire school districts. We just submitted on April 2nd an application for the uh, ESSA Innovative Assessment Demonstration Authority. Um, we, we'd like to think that uh, we have a good chance at that. After all, the law was written with uh, very intense involvement on the part of, uh, at that time, New Hampshire DOE folks and this, my organization, the Center for Assessment. Uh, it was modeled a lot off of uh, what we learned uh, through these pilots. And this uh, rebalancing means that all of the information and the, and the control of the conversation just doesn't happen from the state level assessment. Um, that it, it's supported by the use of local and what we call common tasks um, that are common among the participating districts along with some very limited use of the state assessment. It helps us to provide a, a more balanced approach to the assessment enterprise. And so this is a, a picture of what it looks like in, in New Hampshire. And if you're looking at your screen, um, you'll see it says PACE, comparable to annual determinations all, all the way on the right. So that at the end of the year, we need to mimic in some ways what's produced from the state assessment. We need to declare for every uh, child in every grade whether or not they are in level one, two, three, or four in English language arts and mathematics, and then you know three times in their career for science. And so, um, but to do that, people think that, well, we've just replaced the state assessment with a, a single common performance test. And, um, and we haven't done that. We, that because I, as I always say, that would be replacing a reliable assessment with an unreliable assessment because any single uh, state assessment is, uh, any single performance task is not that reliable on its own. It's with the collection of other information. And so what we see here, and I just made this up that let's say there were four competencies. For each competency, there would be a lot of local performance assessment information feeding into these competency determinations that all feed into these district-level competency scores that are then calibrated with this PACE performance task, and through some uh, pretty ingenious uh, approaches, we come out with these PACE comparable annual determinations. And it's proved quite successful over the years that we've been doing this. Um, Again, the whole reason for moving to PACE is, um, is to, to provide a rich way to evaluate the competencies that students are expected to be uh, mastering through their K-12 career. And again, 
we're providing through the combination of the local and the common task, students are provided with multiple and varied opportunities on both learning and assessment tasks. Here's another uh, kind of problem we see for PACE. This was used uh, in geometry a few years ago. And this is, uh, this has got a lot of notoriety. It's the water uh, tower proposal. Your town's population is predicted to increase over the next three years. Um, you're asked to address this issue in terms of the town's water supply. In order to meet the needs of the town, you need to make a proposal to add a water tower somewhere on town property that would be capable of holding uh, 45,000 uh, cubic feet of water. And the town, here's the, where the math really comes in, the town's looking for a water tower to contain the most amount of water while using the least amount of construction material. And that's a very real problem, right? You're trying to minimize cost, trying to maximize stability, um, and things like that. And so um, the student's job is to both prepare, they have to do the mathematics of preparing a proposal, and then they actually have to present that um, to a town planning committee. Uh, to, and this is a, students were very engaged in this task, and they ended up making models and things like that. Um, here's at a, at a younger age. We, uh, this is on energy transfer, as we call it, the solar cooker. And, um, and this is actually a, quite a common thing around the world. You're working for a company that wants to find an affordable and environmentally friendly way to reduce the needs for wood and charcoal, which, as many people know in the third world countries, are uh, disappearing resources. So you've been asked to create a device that uses renewable energy and go through this. And this, your final goal is to produce a cooker that will change the temperature of a cup of water. That's the actual real world test. Uh, the kids had a phenomenal time doing this. They came up with amazing designs and, uh, and they learned a lot of mathematics and science while doing it. Um, so these are nice tasks. Uh, we're quite proud of these tasks, but that's, we're trying to move away from the one-off model. And um, is this, uh, in my world of, of educational measurement and assessment, we have this notion of principled assessment design. There's a few different models in there. The idea is that we're trying to move a little bit away from the art to more of a science so that we could actually make these things more replicable and that um, it, it make them a little less, uh, uh, require a little less effort on the part of educators and others constantly reinvent the wheel and so we're, we're working on these, we've worked on these task templates that allow groups to go through and create tasks um, in, in, a, in a more principled way that, that allows for uh, higher quality and, um, and, and sort of less artwork, if you will. We still have a lot of challenges, right? And so one of the things when we care about individual student results is, is the notion of scaffolding. What's the role of the teacher uh, or other adults in guiding the student towards competency. At some point, you have to see if the student's able to do it on their own, but if, you, if you're doing a three-week task and a student is struggling, uh, it's, it's you know, not that responsible for a teacher just to let them struggle for that amount of time. Uh, you know, a lot of the work we're interested in doing is group work, and as many of you know, uh, someone who's able to work well in groups is, is likely to be successful in the, in the 21st century economy. And we see that for extended tasks as well. But at certain points, and I have, uh, I have three kids, and uh, the, my daughters complain about this more, uh, doing group work, is that they end up doing all the work. Now, probably every kid in the group says they're doing all the work and everybody's taking the credit, but you've all heard that argument. So we try to balance the group work with the individual work. We try to make sure there's isolated parts for individuals to do, but also allow for the affordances of group work. Again, I talked about generalizability. Um, comparability is a big issue when we're using these things as part of uh, any level of accountability. When students demonstrate uh, competency, especially if they have choice in doing so, how do we know that the multiple ways are comparable enough? They don't have to be perfectly comparable, but comparable enough. And then assessment literacy is, a, is an ongoing struggle. And it's not new, right? This is a colleague of mine, Rick Stiggins, has been writing about assessment literacy since the early 90s. Um, uh, folks like Jim Popham and, and Jim McMillan have been uh, writing books on this left and right. And so um, 
but what, we're really raising the stakes on assessment literacy. A lot of what they had written about in the past is, is helping people create better, better multiple choice questions. Not so much Rick, but others. Um, but now we're really raising the stakes for assessment literacy by, by including the requirements for competency and other deeper learning systems. So we learned a lot about how to improve teachers, teacher learning from how to improve classroom assessment practices in general. And, and this is where this is important for legislators and legislative staffers to be hearing this. This is not something that is going to happen overnight. And it doesn't happen by simply adding one or two more courses to a pre-service program, because this requires teachers to be working with students um, essentially full time to be able to engage in this work. But they need time, they need conceptual and strategic part, uh, support. The teachers working together with other teachers is a great start, but, but sometimes they need some expert guidance and facilitation and tools to be able to move to the next level. And then they need the ability to try these practices out um, in their own context. Um, I clicked the wrong thing. Then uh, finally, uh, you know, one of the other things we've learned, and I've seen this through the years, the, the, the worst thing we could do is, is pretty much ex is exactly what I'm doing now, is just lecturing to you for an hour on, on this stuff, but this is, I know this is just an overview. But if we really want people to move to the next level of assessment literacy, we, uh, you know, we, we learned a lot from Dick Elmore, Harvard uh, school reform expert, and, and this principle six is the key. We learn to do the work by doing the work, not by telling other people to do the work, not by having done the work at some time in the past and not by hiring. And so uh, what I say is we're employing these uh, competency-based education and personalized learning strategies because we're in trying to engage students in more meaningful and authentic learning. So why would we then sit and lecture to our educators and our educational leaders? We have to all engage in the work. Here's a... Uh, one is a task on the right, you can't see the task, but this was a, an old task from Wyoming that was a fabulous uh, life science task. But one of the things that I've seen through the years is, uh, you know, in spite of what I showed you on the slide about the, uh, what we've learned from teacher research, the one thing I would add to this is that we've seen this professional development become most effective when the work counted. So back in the day, uh, uh, starting in 1999 through mid-2000s, as part of Wyoming's graduation system, we ha schools were required to assemble with, with students a body of evidence that documented students' learning of the key standards through the years. And this was done largely through high-quality performance tasks. Um, and, and similarly, we'll just talk to you about New Hampshire's PACE pilot. In both cases, though, the development of performance tasks wasn't just a nice um, distraction from, you know, teaching your kids that day. The development of these performance tasks were, were critical for being for use in, 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 uh, in systems that uh, counted. So in the case of the Wyoming Body of Evidence System, it counted for students' certification for graduation. In New Hampshire's PACE pilot, the results count for accountability purposes uh, for the school accountability system. And so these professional learning opportunities were authentically connected to the assessment, state assessment accountability systems almost immediately. And that just raised people's uh, uh, interest and, and, and engagement considerably. Um, and there's the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll hit on here is uh, is, you know, you have to build this capacity statewide, but the idea, uh, people talk about train the trainers as if there's evidence that it's ever worked, and it really hasn't worked. Um, it's like I was liken it to a bad game of uh, telephone that you see played at little kids' birthday parties where they go around the circle and the message gets distorted by the time you get all the way around. Um, there are, there are other research-based approaches that either build on how apprentices become masters or other gradual releases of responsibility. And we've used this framework to train 
uh, we call cadres of experts, or in New Hampshire we call them content experts, who are teachers who work with uh, the, uh, the true assessment experts over years and, and then lead task development efforts for their peers and things like that. But they are always building their expertise, and eventually we grow that group, but it's not like they're expected to then teach someone else who's supposed to teach someone else. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the need for real innovation in our uh, technology support, um, and that's both for the program we're trying to implement in New Hampshire and other places. And, you know, the kind of things we'd like to see uh, technology used for is, is uh, collaborative task authoring. So teachers didn't have to sit in the same room, uh, uh, you know, pouring over the same piece of paper together. Now, it's true, they, they do that in the same room and they use Google Docs, um, but, but they're having these conversations. And that's, that's a piece that's uh, right now that well, single piece is probably solvable through certain things like Google Docs and, and other types of uh, collaborative platforms. What we're hoping for is to get these multiple components in a single platform so we don't need 10 different technology solutions. This notion of asynchronous scoring, um, so if we want to have double scoring, right, I could have two of us in the same room doing that. But again, that means bringing lots of people together. And many of the uh, large-scale test developers have these uh, distributed systems where people could sit in their pajamas and score tasks. And that's important for us to be able to get some double scoring on these tasks so we're able to evaluate consistency. Uh, again, there are systems for that. There are systems for collaborative authoring. We're trying to get the holy grail of get everything in once. Doing this cross-school, across-district calibration to be able to upload and archive student work for a variety of purposes, and then uploading and archiving other data like school grades and demographics. So to get that, we're, we're looking for that uh, sort of magical technological solution that will truly enable us to scale. And if you have uh, any more, uh, if you have questions that uh, we don't get to today, uh, you could reach out to me at any time. I'm quite responsive by email or uh, call me up. So um, I think I turn it back to Sunny now. Is that right? That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Marion. That was a really helpful uh, overview of performance-based assessments. We are opening it up for questions. You can type your questions into the box on the left uh, of your screen. And um, in the meantime, I'll pose a question. Um, Dr. Marion, what have you found to be some of the mindset changes that need to first be addressed to help states and systems move toward performance-based assessments? And what have you seen some successful strategies around engaging stakeholders in conversations about performance-based assessments? Um, that's a great question. So uh, and I'm gonna, I don't mean this to be overly simplistic answer, but student work. Student work doesn't lie. And um, we did a study back in 1992, I'm giving away my age, um, uh, that uh, where we actually had parents sit down and, you know, uh, look at their students' work on performance assessments or the results on a standardized test that was, you know, a very pretty score report and things like that. And overwhelmingly, they valued being able to see the, the nuances of the work that their students produced. And so, you know, we... we in France, they, uh, when the state exam is, uh, the results are released, they, they print actual tasks or problems in the newspaper, and people sit around cafes and try to solve these problems together. And we are so quick to rush towards quantification. So I would say that, you know, one of the fastest ways to do that is to actually, you know, like these little examples I've showed you about the you know, the water tower or the solar cooker, and then if you actually saw the student work associated with that, it would be mind-blowing. So to try to convince people or uh, at, at a high level 
of saying, oh, this is like like I just tried to do about you know deeper learning and all this stuff. Um, that's it's nice to have that background, but actually seeing the quality of work and then listening to kids. We have lots of videos of kids talking about how much they're enjoying working on these assessments. This is really different than the stuff we do ordinarily by taking tests and things like that. And I get to actually show my creativity and, and you know, collaborate with my friends and, and, uh, and other kids in the class, and we get to really wrestle with hard problems. So uh, that, that combination of student work and student voice uh, sells this like nothing else. Thank you. That's really helpful. Uh, knowing that you have um, state legislators and legislative staff as your audience today, um, with the caveat that designing system-wide reform is difficult and messy, um, do you have any advice for state policymakers about staying the course through this messiness? Yeah, you know, that's a great question um, because, as we know, the, uh, the average uh, uh, tenure of state chiefs, uh, education chiefs right now is, you know, is not much different than district superintendents. Um, and so, uh, you know, two to three years. And so that's, that's a real challenge. So uh, a key thing is building this culture, uh, you know, throughout institutionalizing it throughout uh, both departments of education and, and legislatures and state boards of education, you know, the triumvirate of uh, education governance in many states, and certainly the governor's office. But, it's, um, but, but if it's seen as top-down, and this is the tricky thing, because I've talked to many uh, legislators around the country, if it's top-down, it's going to be hard to be sustained when uh, people leave office or state chiefs leave office or things like that. So the thing that has been helpful in New Hampshire, we've done this both bottom up and top down, where we've, we've built this culture among many of the districts who would be very upset if this went away and, and the state chief and others hear from them directly. But again, it's, it's building that same, um, uh, uh, it's building that same uh, uh, sort of uh, culture of change that we want in teachers of, among uh, legislative leaders that have to see that this is this is worthwhile. Um, and, and it depends on the state. It depends how quickly they turn over. You know, if it's housed within a particular committee. So for years, I think it was about six or seven years, I worked very closely with the uh, Wyoming had a select committee on uh, education accountability as they were developing their comprehensive accountability system. And uh, this is a committee that met uh, almost exclusively in the interim. <coughs> but they uh, didn't have that much turnover, thankfully. And, and, and the chairs didn't turn over um, except once. Uh, uh, one, one of the chairs, one of the co-chairs turned over. But we built that institutional knowledge within this interim committee. Um, so. Uh, it's not easy, though. That's one of our greatest challenges. Looks like the questions are being fired left and right. Uh, <clears throat> um, so I don't know how you want to handle these, Sonny. I think it's just scrolling past fast, and you want to pick some out. Um, yeah. Well, along those same lines, what, uh, what kind of feedback do you get from teachers about moving toward performance-based assessments and their experience with them? Yeah, so um, it's not. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie and say it's universal love, um, and uh, but I would say most teachers like seeing their kids engaged, um, the vast majority, and most teachers struggle with, uh, and this is where they need support from their school leaders and district leaders. They are um, they need to be relieved of certain uh, box checking. I'll call it like. Did you check off all the standards you're supposed to hit in this unit? Um, because if you're going to do something that's deeper, it's not going to be as broad. And so they need permission um, to prioritize certain aspects of content. And, and I think that's completely fine because if you learn something deeper, you'll pick up the other stuff. And so, but they, the teachers, if they, if they don't have support from their school leaders, will really feel those who have support from their school and district leaders seem to flourish. Um, and where you build this culture of looking at student work together and, and, and calibrating. And the, the teachers say 
uh, many of the teachers we work with, we, we will never go back to anything else. This is this is what we're doing. Um, I see it's an important question. Has there any evidence to support better student outcomes, particularly in terms of college career readiness, from using the performance-based assessments? So, uh, you know, the, the research from uh, our New Hampshire project is, is still in its, its early stages. We've seen actually pretty impressive gains for students who are most at risk, students with identified disabilities and economically disadvantaged students uh, right up the bat. I, I don't know that I would say college ready yet because it's too new to, to say that. But there's been a wealth of evidence, uh, both internationally um, uh, and, and nationally, that, that talks about the, the importance of students being able to demonstrate their knowledge, to generate explanations, to generate uh, text and response problems in order to be college ready. As, as many of you know, you know, it's sure you take some multiple choice tests in college, but a lot of it is about writing papers, conducting experiments, doing investigations, designing websites, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Almost uh, not exclusively performance-based, but a lot of performance-based. And so the ability to, uh, to, to engage in these kind of self-regulatory practices where you have to uh, monitor your own learning and, and control your own uh, activities are really critical. But there is, uh, in that volume uh, that I showed uh, of, uh, 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 from the National Research Council, there was a later volume called Knowing What Students Know in 2001, and then subsequently there's just a, a ton of research uh, uh, showing that performance-based assessments are, um, um, are, are supportive of deeper learning on behalf of students. And I'd be happy to share some of those. I actually put together for uh, a, a state uh, uh, not to be named, uh, was in, involved in a legislative issue uh, to produce a list of citations around this. Um, Great. Uh, uh, another question is what, what other states beyond New Hampshire um, might states look to that are uh, trying to implement some level of performance-based assessments? Oh, so there's, yeah, I mean, New Hampshire doesn't have the corner on this market by any stretch of the imagination. They're, they're doing something differently. So the, you know, it's the, one of the oldest ones is the New York State Performance Assessment Consortium. Um, that's been in existence for 20 years, a set of districts that have had a waiver from the New York State regents for years. That's probably one of the most well-known uh, programs in the country. There are other programs around the country that are maybe not fully statewide or things like that, but they are doing things that are, are quite interesting. Uh, Kentucky's new science assessment system is uh, they're, they're producing uh, classroom assessment tasks that they're distributing to help um, educators develop their literacy uh, around the next generation science standards. There's, um, I'm trying to think offhand, you know, in, in Wyoming, there's still a, uh, still a lot of people using the uh, body of evidence assessment activities that were developed years ago. So, so we're seeing a lot of that. I, I could, uh, California has uh, in various districts, um, mm -hmm. so statewide has, and their districts are bigger than most states. Uh, and speaking of big districts, uh, Gwinnett County, Georgia, um, is uh, is doing some phenomenal work around performance-based assessments. And there, I, I joke, I, I advise them, and they're uh, they're they're bigger than uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, more students than New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine put together. So, uh, Rhode Island has a long history of doing uh, work in this area. So there's quite a few. Oregon as well has a long history. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, we are going to, um, I'm just going to pose one last question, sure. um, really around, you know, given that the performance-based assessments are both more time-consuming as well as more expensive, what recommendations might you share about building the support to move toward these assessments? Yeah, so uh, they are more time-consuming, but if you view them as instructional activities as well as assessment activities, then they're not more time consuming. And so, again, it depends on the use. If they're just dropped down from the state as part of a state assessment where you have to stop teaching, 
then they are more time consuming. But if they're more integrated into instruction as uh, end of unit assessments and things like that, um, then, then they're not necessarily more time consuming, they're just differentially time consuming. Um, and expensive, the expensive part is on the development of assessment literacy. Um, you know, if, if you're doing this as a state level assessment, then to score them in a, in a uh, in, you know, having a, all the assessments scored centrally, that is more time consuming, but we've moved tremendously on um, AI scoring, artificial intelligence scoring, that's uh, helping to break that cost curve. So it really depends on the level of the system you're talking about. At the school and district level, yes, um, a little bit more expensive, but again, if it, if it becomes fully integrated into instruction, it's no more expensive. At the state level, we have developed some ways to help break the cost curve a little bit, like using uh, technology to help score these things. Okay, terrific. Well, we'll stop there and thank you so much, Dr. Marion, for this really useful overview and for joining us today. Um, My pleasure. Thank you. This webinar and the PowerPoint will be available to watch on the NCSL website in a few days, so you can share it with your interested colleagues. Uh, I encourage you to stay tuned to the NCSL website for information about upcoming webinars in our series for the NCSL Student-Centered Learning Commission. And please uh, reach out to me if I can be of assistance or make connections um, with Dr. Marion or any of the research that he spoke about today. I want to thank again the Nellie May Education Foundation um, and our sponsor, the NCSL Student-Centered Learning Commission. And thanks to you all out there for joining us today. I encourage you to stay connected and get in touch if we can be of assistance. Have a great rest of your day and a wonderful weekend. The webinar is now concluded. <laughs>